You will sleep better than you have ever slept. You've never been this relaxed. Are you ready to change your life? I'm Rusty Diamond, certified hypnotist. You don't need to leave your house. You can stay in your bed. You can stay in your favorite chair. You just need a computer or your phone. You can get a hold of me. Stay at home. I'll make your life better. Hypnosis is great.com. It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. Yo, man, Boomus Rusty, welcome to the Public Access Podcast, the P podcast here on the Rusty Diamond Broadcast Network, uh, coming to you from Pennsylvania, so it's the P, -p, -p, -p podcast, and that's what matters, so yeah, you know what, uh, hey everyone, thank you for being here, thank you for listening, if you want to watch, you can watch on youtube or rumble i don't know what kind of podcast sometimes it can only be on rumble because youtube has some specifications that i'm not always super fond of uh shout out to youtube if you want to pay me money you can pay me money but you don't have to It'd be nice though anyhow it's uh time for me to bring out my special guest because it's tuesday and i mean special guest day so my bring on my special guest right here, right now, and my special guest right here and right now is Mike Vera. How are you doing? Hello, hello. I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank you for being on. I appreciate it. Um, let's see. So where are you uh, in the world? Right now, I'm in Greenville, South Carolina, but I'm actually from Pennsylvania, from Philly. Oh, you're from Philly. Okay. Okay. All right. What what part of Philly are you from? Northeast Philly, Bustleton area. And uh, that's where I was born and raised. But then I did spend some time living in the ghetto in Olney, North Philly, which, uh, man, what a place that is. I mean, you don't hear much about North Philly as much as you do South or West. Yeah, because people stay away from there because it's so dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh what, what were you uh were you like in the city in the city when you were there yeah i went to temple so i was okay. i guess just outside of the actual uh bustling city but you know just take the subway straight down and uh it's uh it'll keep you on your toes that's for sure sure when uh was the last time you were back over there Ooh, it's been about two years, probably. I still have some friends there that I like to go visit. Uh, when I was going to Temple, I, I made friends with a lot of the doctors going to Temple Medical School. And so oh, okay. some good people to know there. Yeah. Um, what? Uh, how'd you end up hanging with doctors or people that were going to be doctors? Were you in a related field or were you just... Not drawn to these people that's it yep just drawn to these people uh my dad's a doctor so i guess uh, there's a sense of familiarity there and okay. i saw a group of doctors hanging out outside of the building that i was living in and so i approached them and just said what's up and then the rest is history and so are you i so are you you're the non-doctor of the group that's uh but then by proxy gets to learn all the stuff about uh what doctors know without having to pay for a uh doctor degree <laughs> exactly yeah well as a uh not not to shift into promotion i'm not saying this to promote but as a, a board certified health coach 
I do feel like I fit into that kind of social group. So I, yeah. I definitely relate to it. And I, I mean, I'm the medical system is so broken. I'm trying to take a sledgehammer to what's left of it. That's a big part of my mission. So uh, it's an interesting dynamic being friends with doctors who are in this this broken system, doctors who who do great work, who are working hard and are stuck in, in a system that, you know, could use a lot of improvement. But I am the uh, black sheep for lack of a better term. So it, it's it's interesting yeah. to be friends with with people who we see eye to eye on a lot of things, but definitely very different on a lot of other things. So are there uh, maybe not your your friends, but are a lot of the other doctors just do you think unaware of how fuck things are or is it part of the the deal with uh, with kickbacks and stuff of, uh, you know, how many uh, different things can pay you money to be able to push certain certain things or um, I mean, just yeah, I mean, the oversimplification of it all. Um, and yeah, whether you know how much stuff is being meant to uh, treat, not to cure the old, you know, and, and very simplified terms, but um, are you I, yeah, I don't know. How, how does one be perceived when they are the wanting to dismantle it all? Yeah, taking a sledgehammer to the status quo. There, right. there are a lot of different groups because I, I do talk to a lot of doctors, even outside of my own social circle. And one group, I would say, you know, some of them are very awake. They really understand that the system is broken, that, like you said, people are being treated and not cured. And you have to wonder about certain business models of the pharmaceutical companies and things like that. Uh, then there's a whole other polar opposite group of people who I think are so deep in the system that have spent so much time going through the indoctrination that school puts you through. And I say that neutrally, indoctrination, uh, being instilled with a doctrine, that they're so deep in it that it's hard to really take a step back and see the truth. And and I call this the closeness problem. I think other people have called it other things, but it's like if you're looking at an elephant and your eyes are almost touching the elephant, like you're really right up against the elephant. You can't see what the elephant really looks like. You just see the color and, and like the texture. So in order to see that whole elephant, you have to take a step back, a few steps back and you go, oh, here's the big picture. And I think a lot of doctors are right up against the elephant. And so they either can't see it or they refuse to take a step back because they're so comfortable right close to that elephant. There's a lot of intricacies to this mess of a healthcare system that we have. Yeah, or else they see the, you know, a gray hairy thing and they're like, okay, well, since it's a gray hairy thing and that what I've been told, if it's a gray hairy thing and that's all I see, it must be an elephant. Yep, they're trying to diagnose without having all the information, yeah. Yeah, and so, I mean, when, when you're coming into this, like, with the ones that that are deep into it is there you know it looks like the the i don't know i feel like with a lot of things right now there's not a agree to disagree and that's really been something that's been shattered is there that with the doctors that are so close up to the elephant um, where you can get to agree to disagree, or is it just uh, I'm standing my ground, I'm right, you're wrong? There's definitely still some of that standing my ground. And and people in general, even beyond doctors, people have a tendency to hold on to the beliefs that they are already holding in their head. Plenty yep. of that going on. I'm very proud to say that the Healthy and Awake community that I've built, it, all kinds of doctors that disagree on, on every, even beyond doctors, all kinds of people that disagree. And so we are leading by example and saying, you know, th this is going to sound so lame and I apologize, but we're leading from a place of compassion and love. 
again, I know how lame that sounds, but typically, especially on the internet, it's like, if I disagree with you, I hate you, right? That you see a right. lot of that. Like, I can't be your friend. I can't socialize with you if I disagree with you. And that wasn't always the case. Like we used to be able to disagree and get along. And yeah. so I really think it's important to, to lead by example and say, hey, I, I disagree with you. You disagree with me. That is great. I love that we disagree. Let's see what we have in common. Let's see what we can actually find some things we do agree on so that we can continue to get along instead of making enemies out of ourselves unnecessarily. For maybe one thing that you have that you disagree on, but then there's 99 other things that you do agree on that you just completely gloss over because of this one thing that's so important to you that uh, if you disagree with this, that's it. There's my line in the sand. Fuck you. Yeah. And actually that you, that's a really good point because I think a big part of the problem with being able to agree to disagree and being able to get along with people you disagree with is that these ideas that we hold in our head, a lot of us cl closely tie it to our identity. Like if I'm some kind of political party, like that is who I am. That's my team. That is the essence of my being. And therefore, if you criticize this political party, you're criticizing who I am as a person. And that's going to hurt. So, right. you know, there is a lot to it. Like maybe you over there could not you specifically, Rusty, but you on the other side, maybe you could be a little better and giving me some slack. But also maybe I could be better at relinquishing these ideas from my identity. And these are just ideas that I hold instead of these ideas holding me. So it is, it takes two to tango. It's, it's really both parties uh, need to make an effort. Yeah. And I think you, I mean, like we were saying about just being able to let that not be your identity, because I think that's even a big problem. There's so many people that have made that their identity that they don't know who they are. If someone uh, like disagrees with that or even questions it, like this is who I am, and it's like no, that's not who you are. If that is who you are, that is sad. And I, I wish the, I can help you to find more out about you that that's not all, who you are. That like like you said, it's a that's a belief that they or, you know whoever holds. And it's not who they are. It's just, yeah, one part of a, a belief of that they have. And um, and that's, yeah, but then, like, I, cause I've said that, and I've, I've got called horrible shit for that, for, for telling people that. Um, and, you know, that's fine. I, I'm okay with that. But that's, that's how I feel about it. Um, and I don't know. I I yeah. I I wish that there would be more people who would just be okay with letting that go. I mean, I I probably have some stuff that I hold on to that I will get um you know a bit uptight about. But most of the time, I realize it. And if I uh well, I'll, I'll, you know, like okay, shit, what am I doing here? Uh, like what's this really going to do if I, if I hold on to this and um, I'm not going to change their mind. Um, you know, it's like, like, you know, going back to voting or whatever, something simple, like you get people, the whatever. Now it's a much longer time frame, but let's say like a, a few days before voting, like, Oh, who are you going to vote for? Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Probably no one. Uh, but then it's like, okay, well, you know, maybe you're, I'll get you to vote for someone else. But everyone kind of knows there's not people kind of waiting on the fence, I don't think, of what they're doing. But I don't know. I don't think that there's a lot of people who are just open to whatever else is and letting beliefs not be their identity and just I guess letting beliefs not be your identity is because it's been so like, put on a pedestal to make your beliefs your identity it's like people really start to praise these people and then you get this these inflated egos of 
this is who I am. But when in reality, that's not at all who they are. That's a, it's a, just something they believe. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the environment has played a huge role in how this has come to be because of course the internet is still relatively new. I mean, I, I was born in the nineties. I grew up with the beginning of the internet. I'm like the Napster generation. So it is still relatively new and it's worth asking, like, what role does the Internet play in this new phenomenon where people have these ideas that are so closely tied to their identity that they can't get along with anybody else who has differing opinions? And there's a lot of things like echo chambers, where if you're online, if you're hanging out in social media groups, on Facebook groups and Reddit pages, you know, you're basically in a space uh, typically where all the ideas where you've ended up are just ideas you already agree with. And then, of course, there's censorship, there's social pressure, there's all these other factors controlling the narratives that manifest themselves online, that end up making its way into your mind. Th things aren't exactly as they seem. Like, if you look around outside in the real physical world, things are pretty much as they seem. But the internet is curated. The internet has algorithms that affect what you see and and it's easy to take for granted that it is a curated space, that it can manipulate how we think, that it can shape our identity and cause us to behave in ways that maybe we would have not if we weren't spending all this time online. So it, it's it's something to think about for sure. And what the fuck can you learn in an echo chamber? Yeah, makes I mean, you weak. Yeah, and uh, so like... Yeah, when, when 2020 came around, and maybe it just kind of like, yeah, there was there was a few events, like I started seeing that, and then it was like, if you, you know, a bunch of people saying a bunch of different things, and then uh, I'm going to delete everyone or that doesn't agree with me, what wherever they are on the their spectrum of that this is their reality and i i just took the whole thing like you know what fuck this like i just unfollowed everything i'm like dude like I, i'm not playing into this game like we we can all talk with who whomever like if uh you know i i wanted to have people like disagree with me i don't want to have everyone on on here that agrees with me on everything and um I'm not going to shut someone out who has a different point of view um, and just like, okay, that's great. Okay, so there's like, yeah, I don't know. There was way too much of an echo chamber thing and like uh, just questioning anything became a line in the sand, uh, which was, I don't know, scary is almost the word, but um near near scary or close to scary when questioning something becomes a, a line in the same because it's yeah that they're who is who they are or who they think they are and uh, it's i don't know kind of uh kind of fucked yeah I guess. It, it it is another weird thing that's happened uh where asking questions about certain things get you called a conspiracy theorist right if if right. the if the government asks questions about us, the citizens, that's an investigation. But if we ask questions about the government, that's conspiracy theorizing all of a sudden. And some people really don't like that. And I do want to comment on something you said where there is a fine line to walk. Yes, it, it's good to avoid creating echo chambers in your digital spaces so that you can have some intellectual strength and, and you know, contend with ideas that are not your own. At the same time, there is such a thing as toxic people, people who have no interest at all in exchanging ideas authentically. They don't care what you have to say. They're just trolls, basically, people trying to assert an agenda. And and just like if, if I was being exposed to some kind of toxic chemical in the air, I would move the hell away from that toxic chemical. So if I'm right. being exposed to toxic ideas from toxic people where it's creating a toxic environment... Well, I want to get the hell away from that, just like those toxic chemicals. So it is a fine line to walk. I mean, that's what I fucking did. I was just like, fuck all this, dude. I don't, it's nothing that's good for me is coming from this. And like, 
I can still communicate with whoever I want to. They can still like they know how to get a hold of me. It's not gonna. I'm not gonna miss. The only thing is, I'm not gonna see everyone's status update of whatever their uh, belief is of whatever is happening that day, and or what they ate for me. lunch, <laughs> or what they ate for lunch. And yeah, just like okay, I'm I'm done with this shit. Um, I thought about just leaving social media altogether then even because, uh, yeah, like, I don't know, because, yeah, when everything kind of happened, I, I was living in Minnesota then. Um, it was it was interesting. I was living like I almost the day I, I was going to move the day before to either the spot um, in Minneapolis or go out into the country. And I ended up moving out into the country. And then if I would have moved that day to the place in Minneapolis, it was on the street. It would have been the, the day after I moved there, the George Floyd uh, spot on that block. And uh, I was like, yeah, I think I, I made the right right choice there. Like, I don't know. I, I liked being able to get out into the country. I It's been nice. Um, but then, yeah, just even getting, I guess, away from everything on on, on the internet uh, for the most part, and I don't know if some like if something happens, I have a a friend, uh, my buddy Quiz, who's been on a couple times recently. Um, like him and I are probably about the same invested in the internet and social media, what's going on. So like, one of us, if we you know something happens and by the time one of us knows then it's like okay then it must be something but um yeah there, there's not too much that's like i can't imagine what i'm missing out on i don't not missing out on but uh what i'm not seeing by this by not worrying about anything of this shit for the last four years yeah you know how much people have just started hating each other for stuff that they're seeing on on the computer screen or their phone just something they're looking at and it just causes fucking rage i don't know what your experience so far in pennsylvania has been like with the people i've been here but... two and a half months oh okay and i'm over in uh in amish country yeah nice so yeah so cool yeah it's a little a little different. I've I only been to Philly once. I went like a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I haven't really got to experience too much of what's going on. And I've been, yeah, kind of recluse for a bit. But um Well nowadays up, yeah. That's good. You don't want to be experiencing too much of Philly nowadays, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I've I've watched that twenty four hour camera in Kensington and uh oh. That shit's wild, man. Yeah. That's just, um, and like, I, I'm from, so I, yeah, I'm from Portland, Oregon. And, mm -hmm. um, dude, like every fucking city on the West Coast, it looks a lot like that. And the weird thing was that New York looked better than any city on the West Coast mm -hmm. now, which is yeah. fucking weird as far as just like, it looking like Kensington, like so much of the cities on the West Coast are just shit, um, physic or you know, physical shit, and yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, lots of people, yeah, just shitting everywhere, and um, yeah, and, like I don't know, it's it's a different feeling throughout the city of what's going on, and um. I don't know. I don't know what to do. I just, I don't know if I want to be by it or not. Or if I do, yeah. it's usually not too long of a time. It's really sad because those are human beings. You know, They're, those are people's family members out there, people's kids, and even some people's parents. It's it's really sad. And I think it's it's easy for a lot of people to see that and think like, oh, they they're drug addicts. They chose that. They should suffer the consequences of, you know, on some level, that's true, right? You make a decision, you should face the consequences of it. But that that coldness is leaving out the part of the conversation 
where we address the sick environment, where we address that, you know, all of this fentanyl and crack and all these drugs are in the environment. They're being dangled in front of these people like low hanging fruits. And on top of the economic stress and all the stress that's going on in the world, it, it's an easy solution for many people who feel miserable, who maybe, you know, barely want to be alive to just use a chemical that makes them forget about that pain, that makes them feel good. Even as they're wandering around like zombies in the streets, it it's a mess. It's sad. And I, I think, I, I don't know what to do about it. I don't know what we can do about it. But again, I, I think part of it does come back to compassion because how are those people ever going to get help if, if we barely even acknowledge that they're human beings needing that help? If we just dismiss them and go, oh, they're just street people now, let's forget about it. It's, I don't think there's an easy solution to that, but it's a mess. Yeah. And I mean, they're going to be keep coming back for whatever it is that, yeah, the fentanyl or whatever. Um, going to get it however they get it. And I mean, whoever. Whoever is fucking selling it is doing great marketing, advertising. Um, you got fucking human billboards walking around is kind of what they turn into. Like, look, what, look at you. You fucking you want to just forget it all, man. Like, here you go. Here's what here's what you can look like. And like, you can get to that. Yeah. And. Man, it's I don't know, it's it's hard. Yeah, because like yeah, I don't know, I don't know what the solution is, and I don't I don't know if the you know there's the um you know like a clean needle exchange and stuff, and uh, you know free places to you know do whatever you're gonna do, um, but I mean most of those places are fucking filthy and it's not like a, a clean place to do it and and there's a lot of stuff that's like supposed to have these really good intentions but is ultimately pretty fucked um like one of them Planned Parenthood uh is one that's a good intention I guess if you're looking at it but then you look into everything about Planned Parenthood and you're just like, oh, this has a totally different reason for why you want to have Planned Parenthood around. And and you start realizing like, okay, this is, it's not for the people, it's for, for someone else to get their agenda out. And- um, For the eugenists. Right? Yep. And I mean, you try telling someone that, and that's one that's like, I don't know, man, because like, I'm okay with with choice and everything of that sort, but like, and then, but then I'm the person who's like, but Planned Parenthood is fucked, like there, that's something that that, and you get proud of, like, no, it's the greatest fucking thing in the world. Right. Like, you're looking at this elephant, it's not an elephant, it's not an elephant, and um. I don't know. I think there's a lot of those things too that like with the whole such a, you know, the magician shit of just, yeah, look look over here while like here's what we're really doing. And Pay I attention that's... to the, the hand on the left while I'm doing something with the hand on the right. right. And our society in many ways has been constructed by eugenists. This is something that people not only don't want to talk about, but as you said, if you bring it up, people freak out. The idea that there are people out there who are resourceful and powerful and wealthy that maybe want to create an environment where we are not able to thrive and be healthy, some people cannot process that information. But it is well-documented, well-substantiated. There are plenty of books. Like This was a, a science back in the day, eugenics, to create a, a purified gene pool, essentially. And I have a book, it, it would blow your mind. It's the science of eugenics that details the work of John D. Rockefeller, how he contributed heavily to sterilization. And it says 
in, in his own words that he wanted to get rid of the imbeciles, the defectives, the idiots. And, and the Rockefellers are extremely powerful. They've played a role not only in medicine, but in education and politics. They're still wow. around today, the Rockefeller family. And, and to think that, oh, maybe they've changed their mind. Nobody talks about eugenics anymore. Maybe they've stopped is ludicrous to the highest degree. And you look right. around, where are all the healthy people? Where like people are being more, they're more and more infertile as each day goes by. People are sterilized and, and yep. it's so easy to go, oh, well, that's, who knows? That's just happenstance. That's just because, I don't know, that's just the way it is. Like, why aren't you looking for more answers? People openly talk about wanting a reduced population. Why is this so crazy? Oh, man. I, I, I'd like to know. I'd like to know why that is um, and why. I mean, I, I assume I know why why they want to, uh, you know, keep it that way. But um, yeah, why? I don't know if it's people don't want to believe that there's something, you know, that, you know, sinister is the right word, but sort of. But I mean, or you know, like uh, you, you know. Okay, yeah, sure. Like the the government or whatever fucking thing, they oh sure they lied in the past, but now like you know, come on, like we're 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 not going to be fooled, uh, fooled now or you know like you know same thing with the news or something like no man like they're not they're not going to lie. Well, what, what would they get from from lying to us and like wow well, you know why would they be pushing some agenda? of of something um i don't know man it's well it's you nailed hard. it you nailed it it it's at the heart of that is intellectual laziness it's basically saying i already have these ideas about how the world is and that's just how it is and part of that comes along with questions just like the ones you asked why would somebody want to do that how could they even do that questions that they're asking not to find the answer but asking rhetorically as a dismissal of any possible uh, of any possibility that eugenics could be in place today and actually be true. They're asking questions like, you know, how could somebody do that? Just just to marginalize what somebody is saying about eugenics. It, it's intellectual laziness to the maximum extent. It's it's refusing to engage with the ideas that you're holding in your head. It's refusing to ask questions and actually answer them. It's refusing to connect dots that are so obviously there. It is intellectual laziness, which is facilitated by an extreme level of comfort. We can play video games, we can watch TV, we can scroll through our phones, we can eat all the junk food we want. We have an abundance of comfort, which makes it easy to do anything intellectually challenging because we're just so comfortable. And I think that's a big part of where this comes from. Oh, I mean, they're trying to make us more comfortable too. Um, I mean, we have, we have 15 minute cities coming into place where, and that's going to be a whole fucking thing with, um, you know, why, you know, uh, cause you know, they had those, um, studies with, was it gerbils or hamsters or something where you just like, you end up giving them kind of everything they need, the food and the water, then you just kind of watch what they do. And, um, they, yeah, and then they just, why would I want to go somewhere else or do something when everything is literally right here and handed to me? Like, fuck, why? Everything's fucking spoon fed to me. I, I, I sit in here and someone is taking a, you know, a spoon or a fucking water bottle and shoving it in my mouth. And that's all I got to do is open my mouth and I'm good. And, I, you know, and then eventually, yeah, then you're going to get uh, probably need to go to the doctor uh, after that and then get put on this to take care of this, uh, to treat this and then get this to treat what is now being uh, treated and then something to counteract that to be able to do that and yeah, it's a circle jerk yeah hopefully something something will pan out right because yeah why, why would anyone want um why wouldn't everyone want the best for me 
And I think that's a hard thing for people to think too. That why wouldn't everyone want the best for me? Why wouldn't? Why do I need to look out for myself? Sometimes. Yeah. And it's, it's hypnotizing to use a word related to the show. You know, people can be easily hypnotized into it's, you know, you have people out there saying, Hey, I do want the best for you. I'm in my suit. I'm in a podium. I'm here on TV as a politician claiming to represent you, or maybe it's some kind of author authoritarian doctor of, of the world health organization, something like that. I want the best for you. I'm here. Not a, not out of some kind of financial interest or power play. I'm here out of the goodness of my heart because I want the best for you. And there are people receiving information that that actually think like that, that, that just they see the world simply as it looks. They don't know how to think any deeper. They don't know how to look intricately at, at certain details. And that's how people really get into trouble. It is a dangerous level of naivety to be so naive that you can trust people that might harm your health. And that's why I I really argue for skepticism, which is something that's been demonized. We, we talked about this earlier, like asking questions. Skepticism is one of the most mentally healthy things you can do to be skeptical to not only is it, you know, intellectually engaging to be skeptical because you have to ask questions and answer them. But it could save your life if you're skeptical against somebody who's telling you to take some kind of new medical intervention and you decide to be skeptical, that could save your life. That skepticism is healthy. Right. And uh, I mean, what what's the worst that could happen is you get more uh, you learn more and I could. Yeah. Like you said, it could save your life um, pretty easily and just. The fact that it's like, no, like, and it's one of the like, skepticism is one of those words, you know, like back to you, you're saying, you know, conspiracy theorists too, with like, it's become a word to, you know, make someone seem crazy or discredit them or just right out the bat, just like, oh, it's just a, a skepticist. Um, yeah, just that's it. That's all they are like. They're just they, they don't fucking believe anything, you know? Yeah. And to be fair, there are people who take it too far. This is another thing that requires walking a fine line and having balance because you do want to be skeptical, but you also don't want to go so far that you're a paranoid maniac who doesn't trust anything at all. That's not healthy either. Right. I'm talking about health. There is somewhere right in the middle. That's probably the sweet spot for your health where you do want to be skeptical, but you don't want to be too skeptical. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, because, yeah, it can easily go the other way. And uh, that's going to get old real fast. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, and that, that'll make you fucking just as out there. Yeah, like you're saying, you, um, as the person who buys into everything and, you know, lets it. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, I assume then with the super skeptical, it's, you know, taking everything personally and going against beliefs that are now constructed, I guess, that were, you know, that's, uh, you become the skeptical person and mm -hmm. that becomes your identity. Yeah. Well, here's an example. Like, like I said, with your doctor, you want to be a little skeptical of your doctor. You know, especially if they're new and you don't know them. It's like, well, how much are they influenced by pharmaceutical kickbacks? How, even if they're not influenced, how much are they aware of the influence that pharmaceutical companies are trying to, you know, use to manipulate the doctors? There's all kinds of questions that are worth being skeptical of someone like a doctor because they hold your health in their hands. So, yes, be skeptical of your doctor. But Again, there's that fine line. You don't want to be so skeptical of your doctor that you show up to the ER with some kind of medical trauma emergency and and you don't even trust them to save your life. That is way too far skepticism. So there is a, a certain degree of balance needed. Yeah. And I mean, what can you even, yeah, I mean, like, oh, okay, I got shot. But you know what? I don't know, man. Uh, doctors probably won't know what to do. Uh, probably just trying to Bring me out for a few extra bucks, but uh, I can probably take care of it a little bit. Uh, 
Some of the alcohol and uh, YouTube. Uh, YouTube and crazy brew. <laughs> we'll be good. It's new, man. Don't even worry yeah. about it. Exactly. Um, crazy glue is a great, great thing too. If you got some some gashes, uh, crazy glue is all right. But it's okay to have another opinion besides uh, just crazy glue. Yeah, uh, for getting you healed back up. Well, a fun fact is that uh, I looked into this. the The glue that they use now during surgery is basically yeah. the same exact as crazy glue. There's like one extra ingredient that they add in there for the surgical glue but it's it's crazy glue okay well so yeah so yeah so you're set they, they knew they knew okay <laughs> yeah. good so yeah if anyone uh just carry crazy glue around you'll be fine just, yeah uh, yeah hopefully. not not to be interpreted as, as medical advice by the way <laughs> right you have to uh so yeah yeah how is that a disclaimer that has to come up sometimes? Uh, how often do you have to say that? Do you think uh, without so like, if you ideally could just talk freely, would would you be saying that, or would you? Uh, is that something that you feel like you got to throw up sometimes? It, it's a little of both. So I do have to be careful because I am not a medical doctor. I'm a board certified health coach. So if I do step into the territory of saying something that someone might interpret as medical advice, I like to be careful anyway. But the other part that does fuel it, as silly as the sounds, is the South Park creators with their disclaimer that they put at the beginning of every episode. It covers their ass. They get away with so much because they have a disclaimer. It's like, hey, I, I told you right from the beginning not to watch this. If you're offended... That's on you. And I very much align with that philosophy. I'm not afraid to offend people or step on toes. So if I say something that might be offensive or might step on toes, sometimes I'll throw a little disclaimer in there just to protect my own ass a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe this, uh, but then I feel like I should have to have a disclaimer all the time on, and people maybe just get known as the disclaimer guy. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, but I mean, dude, South Park's been unreal the last uh, few years. Just yeah, so good. Um, and then I also finally went and got to see Book of Mormon, which was uh, worthwhile. Saw it, saw it a couple times. Nice. I, I, I saw, yeah, like so. I I was living in Salt Lake City, and then within like what three weeks after moving to to Connecticut, I went and saw Book of Mormon. So I, I was like, right after that, like the, you know, getting right into, uh, I don't know, it was weird. Cause like, yeah, seeing just how much they nailed some things, but um, if you ever get a chance and you haven't seen that. Um, I haven't yet. I'd suggest it. Um, didn't think I'd be into, you like saying, "Oh, I'll go see a musical," but you know when it's when it's the South Park guys, uh, what you gonna do? But... Well, their movie, their first movie, is a musical, and it is yep. one of the best musicals out there. It's so great. I mean, so yeah, so is uh, I mean, Team America. So yeah, is, uh, yeah, Cannibal the musical. I I mean, yeah, Cannibal the musical and bigger, longer, longer, uncut. And I mean, most yep. of their episodes are. Fucking musicals. The the all about Mormons one's a musical. Right. And then um Yeah, it's fucking wild. But um yeah, I mean, yeah, good disclaimer is always it's weird that we have to have disclaimers though, uh in what we say and that is it do you think it's because people can't not everyone's gonna be able to just put it off to the side and say, let me look at it over from here. Or is it just everything comes in is, you know, fact and like shit. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a good point because it is kind of like, um, you know, to put a disclaimer, it's almost like uh, bumper bowling, you know, it's like nerfing the world. Like, Hey, let me disclaim warning. If you're sensitive or something like that, I get it at, at, at the same time. We do live in a pretty litigious society with lawyers and all that. I, I 
I'm not trying to get uh, sued for some stupid thing that I say. So usually when I do throw out a disclaimer, it, it's tongue in cheek, half joking, while also trying to not get sued. It's a little of both. Yeah. And maybe I'm going to have to, after today, might need to uh, throw a disclaimer up on, on the show um, or kind of anything. That's not a bad idea. It's probably just a quick little one. Even if I just steal the South Park one and, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, um, yeah, because I've had it on other shows that I've had and, uh, you know, probably a good idea. It uh, saved my ass before. Uh, so real quick, funny story. When I was a kid sure. in high school, uh, I drew a cartoon of one of the students on a test that I had to hand in. So I, I drew a little cartoon. It was clearly the student. I was making fun of him on the test, just being a stupid kid, you know? Yeah. And right under the cartoon, I wrote, disclaimer, any representation between the character depicted in this cartoon and any students in real life is purely coincidental. Just straight out of the South, South Park, Park book. Yep. And uh, sure enough, I got into trouble. I got sent to the principal's office. I'm sitting there with or uh, the, the dean's office, rather. And so the dean, I'm sitting right across from him and, and he's mean mugging and, and trying to figure out how much trouble I can get in. The principal walks into the room and said, there's a disclaimer. I can't do anything about this. Send him back to class. So they let me go. And, and so ever since that experience as a kid, I'm like, wow, disclaimers are very powerful. I better keep this up. Yeah. And so you have a disclaimer at the beginning of your show. I disclaim like verbally if I'm about to say something that might warrant a disclaimer. Okay. So, but I mean, well, with that then, I mean, what what about people who, with with so much uh, clipping out and taking a step out of context, would I mean? So let's say let's say someone just takes the part after you give the verbal disclaimer, posts it online, it goes viral. And then you have to go, wait, 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 look at this whole clip. Um, I mean, it's not a bad thing to have. Like, not a bad, that bad of a problem to have. Because uh, I guess it'd be, you know, good that your stuff's getting seen enough. Uh, but And that someone has enough time to take it out of context. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, having to be like, wait, hold on. This is like what I really meant. And then how much of an impact does that have? And is the impact gone because people are on to the next thing to be upset about? Or is there uh, some sort of redemption after that? Yeah, well, you took the words right out of my mouth because my first thought is if some if one of my clips went viral, even if it is being taken out of context, that's a net positive, right? I, so I have to defend myself after that. So what, you know, I'm, I mean, I, I'm attacked all day on the internet with some of the stuff that I say. And sometimes I find myself disclaiming after the fact. I, I posted something online, just asking questions about geoengineering. So the, the government spraying things into the sky and and basically telling us that, hey, don't worry about it. It's all safe. It, it's safe and effective. We've heard that before. Yeah. And so I was just asking questions. I wasn't even making assertions. I just said, hey, isn't this interesting? What are your guys' opinions on this? And I got really uh, verbally attacked in the comments from a few select people saying like, oh, this is uh, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs conspiracy theory. Like, how can you even ask questions about this? And look on the government website where it says exactly what this is. So just to like appease those people a little bit, I had to put a disclaimer saying, hey, quick disclaimer. Uh, I'm just asking questions here. I'm not making strong assertions. I'm just trying to create open dialogue. Um, yeah, but in a perfect world, you know, people would either just move on and, and I wouldn't have to dis throw any disclaimers out there. Or they would be tough enough to just go like, oh, okay, I don't, I don't agree with this, but whatever, and and move on. Right. But yeah, disclaimers. I, I, I know where you're coming from. It is, uh, it it shouldn't be necessary in a perfect world. Right. But yeah, we're we're not quite quite perfect yet. So um, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll make do. And um, it's I don't know, man. It's fucking. It's hard sometimes to. And like you said, like with um, someone just going and basically completely dismissing what you're asking and just like, well, this is simple. Like this person just 
fucking you you said you said cuckoo for conspiracy theories. He called it cuckoo for cocoa puffs conspiracy theory. Yeah. Cuckoo for cocoa puffs conspiracy theories. Okay, but if you said if someone is cuckoo for cocoa puffs anything else besides conspiracy theory, you would fucking get hell. Um, <laughs> you would be like whatever whatever it is, you know, you put after that that's not conspiracy theory. Um that that would be something that would uh, yeah fucking I don't know not just bite you in the ass but that would fucking I don't know I don't, you can't you can't fucking say it. that's like the one thing you can say for something being crazy is conspiracy theory and yeah it's a great way to shut down a conversation and shut down open dialogue and. Yeah, I mean, open dialogue is, you're going to get, it's not an echo chamber. You're going to fucking learn new things. You're going to get different insights. Um, I mean, I saw so many, uh, like, for like for instance, for, with comedy, like I saw so many comedy shows that were being booked that were like diverse. Um, and But then it has like, five people that all have the exact same viewpoints, all telling the exact same stories. I'm like, this is not fucking diverse, but then I'll, I'll make a show and I don't know, you know, whatever. Um, I'll just put like five people of very different points of views and backgrounds. And then it's like, Oh, but look at this, look at them. Right. Uh, look at their all, skin color. Look at their skin color. Yeah. And, and like these people are all very fucking different. Like you're missing the whole point of listening to people and, creating this open dialogue um you just taking it to at taking people at their like least not um uh, like kind of at the, like their lowest level of like what what they are you know like the uh going back to the my belief my belief is who i am and it's like well you're that's that is a belief of yours, and that is like, but you are more than that. You're you're more you are more than just, you know, your skin color. I hope, um, I really hope, I really hope, and like, and it sucked, and that became a thing. Like, it's like shit. Like, and then look, what what am I like? I get all kinds of help for that one too. Like. Who are you to say like like I I want people to be fucking deeper like I I would I like they celebrate whatever the fuck you want to celebrate but like I really hope that that's not like all you think that you are yeah and I don't know I get shit a lot I got I've gotten all kinds of shit so it doesn't most of it doesn't bother me some of it you know can bother me some but. Well, I still don't know if I would take back what I would say. No, I think you that's another thing that, that you nailed it because it's it's another example of the closeness problem. I think a lot of these DEI people, these diversity, equity, inclusion people, I think most of them are well intentioned, genuinely. I think you know, most of them actually want the idea of diversity, but it comes back to that closeness problem where they're so close to this DEI ideology, this philosophy that runs through college campuses that it's hard to take a step back and go, oh, we are representing everything we claim to be against. If anybody comes here with diversity of opinion, if, if somebody doesn't agree with me, they're out, they're gone. Right. And that's supposed to be true diversity is, is you know, forget skin color. Who gives a shit about skin right. color? Like we're not really supposed to be thinking about that very much at all. And, you know, di true diversity comes from like cultures and, and ideas. And it, it's the movement has been so distorted. It's it's unfortunate. So I, I'm realizing now with all these things that we discussed, a lot of it does come down to this closeness problem where it's like a magnifying glass is on everything and it's hard to see the full picture. And I think a lot of us need to take a step back so we can see the bigger picture, but realize also why is this closeness problem even here? And and that comes back to the environment, how it's being 
heavily constructed for us on the internet. We have all these things that facilitate a closeness problem, whether we're talking about medicine or or race and diversity and all these different things. It We need more critical thinking. We need to actually, in, instead of just allowing thoughts to appear in our head, which is what a lot of people do, that's not thinking. Letting yeah. thoughts just appear to your head, that's not thinking at all. That's, you know, especially if you're reading. If you're reading something, that's not the same as thinking. That is inserting ideas into your head. We need to critically think more. And I think a lot of these problems will solve themselves. Yeah. And so I would someone who doesn't want to critically think what where where does that leave that person and where does that leave that person compared to society well it's a, a negative for society because there is such thing as the health of society the health of the culture and i think discrimination against people with other ideas as we just talked about is an example of unhealthiness within society. And so I think it starts with calling it out for what it is and saying, look, this is not the way a healthy society functions. Here's a big part of the problem, the closeness problem, the echo chambers, the influence and manipulation that happens with information and, and all these different things. We need to call it out so that we can really address it as a society. And as a health coach, one of the things that like this is the term that I use for health coaching is collaborative critical thinking because most people, they know what they should do for their health. I mean, you're not going to find anybody who doesn't know that they should move around more for their health. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that they should eat less junk food for their health. Like that's no surprise. But the issue is like, how do I really fit this into my schedule and how do I make it stick? That requires critical thinking. And some people... They just need a helping hand. I, like many people are capable of critically thinking about that on their own. They just want to do it a little faster, you know, with an expert who really has done this before. And and so it's critical thinking, but on a collaborative scale. It's it's actually quite fun. Yeah, it's okay. It's fun to think. Uh, it's it's yeah. all right. It's okay. And it's fun to think. So so think. Um, where, where are people finding you on uh, on the internet? I have a show called Healthy and Awake Podcast, which you can find on Apple, Spotify, Rumble, uh, any of those. But my website is redpillhealthandwellness.com, which I know is a lot to type in. So if you go to mikevira.com, that'll basically redirect you to the same place. All right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, some some podcasts have to, I think this one I can I can sneak by with it probably still being on YouTube. Um it doesn't need to be one of the Rumble exclusive episodes, which some of them like. What you gonna do? Yeah. What you gonna do? But um, yeah, man. Thank you for being on. And yeah, if you wanna come back, yeah, a few months and do yeah updates. Uh, you know, unsolved mysteries updates. Uh, yeah. What whatever it may be, yeah, that'd be cool if uh, if you're up for it. So. For sure. Um, Cool. Well, thank you for being on and um, yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your day. All right. You too. Thanks, Rusty. This all was right. fun. Yeah. You bet. Yeah, likewise. All right. Later. All right. Mike Vera. So you guys check him out. I'll put the links down below. That's all you need to do. Just go to the links. You can check it out. And thank you everyone for listening here on the Rusty Diamond Podcast Network. And that is the show. Man, boom! It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker! It's Rusty Diamond Motherfucker